I am rebuilding these videos as a dummy explores Pi system trade rather than a dummy's guide to Pi system trade. The fact is I don't yet know enough about Pi system trade to be anyone's guide, but I do think others who are on a similar journey to me may find value in watching me grapple with this library from square one. Rob's GitHub pages introduce us to a simple trading rule that we'll go through in painful detail in this video. As in the previous video, we start by importing some data from sysdata.blahblah, blah, import CSV futures sim data, and assign it to data. Here, I extract daily price data for crude oil, which has the instrument code crude W and I assign that to price. So here's what it looks like. The tail of price shows these crude oil prices up to October, 2021. We're looking at futures, aren't we? So it begs the question precisely what contracts, i.e. delivery months, are we looking at in this price series? I think the answer in the case of crude is that the prices were stitched together using the, the prices of December delivery crude contracts. Why do I think that? If I run through, if I run this method, get multiple prices, then from the perspective of January, 2021, as in this index, the column price contract here shows December, 2021, uh, December, 2021. I presume this column is saying this was the delivery month that was used in the stitching process. To expand, if we look instead uh, as though we are standing in January of 2020, the price contract column shows December 2020. In fact, the price contract column always only shows December delivery months in the case of crude. So back in 2010, the price contract column is showing December 2010. In 2011, December 2011, and so on. If we run this method, get roll parameters, then we get hold roll cycle equals Z, which stands for December delivery. So presumably hold roll cycle is dictating the delivery months that are used to stitch together a back adjusted price series, as in this price series right here. Cautionary note, we also see priced roll cycle is equal to all 12 months of the year. So we might conclude due to the reference to price here, and also the reference to this, to price in price contract, that's all 12 months are being used to stitch together the price series. But apparently that's not the case, is it? Apparently it, it would seem that hold roll cycle is what's, what is telling us what, the deli what delivery months were used for price stitching purposes. Why for crude is only December used in price stitching? Or, or so it appears to me to be the case. After all, it's clearly possible to trade crude oil for all 12 delivery months of the year. The reason is explained in Rob's blog posts. He has a role policy that takes into consideration certain factors, including the liquidity of various delivery months. In the case of crude, his preference is to trade the December delivery months. Cautionary note, to take crude as an example, the best practice may be to only ever hold the December delivery contract. But if you are a UK spread better, or if you have a very poor futures broker, you may struggle to hold December delivery contracts. You may be constrained to the nearest delivery months. I can tell you that is the case for spread betting um, platforms. The platforms I have seen allow you to trade one or two months ahead, but not uh, 12 months. So, whereas with futures, you could buy the December delivery month and I guess wait the best part of a year before you have to roll to the next contract, with spread betting over the same time period, presumably you'll be ro rolling maybe as many as a dozen times. So if everything I say here is correct, spread betting might be way more expensive than you think versus futures trading. It may be that the number of 
transactions you have to do per year is way higher for spread betting than it is for futures. With all that said, here's Rob's introductory simple trade rule. Note, first of all, it requires that we import another function called robust, vol calc robust volatility calculator. The simple trading rule is the exponentially weighted moving average crossover, EWMAC. This function generates a volatility adjusted forecast, wherein the forecast will be more strongly positive if the faster moving average climbs further above the slower moving average and vice versa. Presumably the forecast will be zero if the two moving averages happen to be equal to one another. Earlier in this video, I explained that it appears for crude, the price series is stitching together using only December delivery month contracts. And likewise, December is also the month we should ideally be trading. So the guidance embedded in this function, which reads, we can't use the price of the contract we're trading, is hard for me to understand because it strikes me that we must use the price of the contract we're trading, um, which is December for crude. <laughs> because after all, the price series all the way up here, well, I'm quite convinced that is based on December delivery contracts. And likewise, we should be trading December. So, um, so I'm struggling with this, we can't use the price of the contract we're trading. Uh, maybe it makes more sense to you. Anyway, price, the price series is then resampled. And this reference to 1B, I think refers to business days. More specifically, each business day, the last price is taken. But by the way, 1B isn't magic. I think it excludes weekends, but as far as I can tell, that's all it does. Why do I think that? Well, this is what happens when you resample at 1B, the crude price series. You get not a number on the 6th of September, 2021. That tells me two things. It, it tells me that 1B is not clever enough to filter out holidays. So it didn't know that the 6th of September was US Labor Day. And also, I'm a little surprised that dot last does not exclude empty rows. But it doesn't, clearly. Turning back to this code here. L slow refers to the slower, the longer moving average which has a look back window of L slow. And I think that's why we have a capitalized L here, look back window. Unless you specify otherwise, the look back window for the slower moving average will be four times greater than the fast moving average. Down here, we calculate the fast and the slow moving averages using a pandas exponential weighted moving function. Well, specifically in our case, the exponentially weighted moving average, hence we have dot mean tagged on at the end. And span in pandas is analogous, I think, to the look back window. So I think it's um, self-explanatory, more or less. Raw exponentially weighted moving average cross is equal to the difference of the fast and the slow. And now we introduce volatility. Volatility is equal to robust vol calc, which which is a function we imported at the start and which is being fed price.diff. Price.diff returns the raw difference between the current row and one row prior, as in the current oil price versus the oil price in the previous row. Volatility is calculated using this imported function. So let's take a look at that function, which I have down here. Let's examine it line by line. To kick off volatility, vol, is calculated by calling another function, simple exponentially weighted volatility calculation, a function which is being fed three things, the daily returns, i.e. price.diff, 
a volatility look back window, which by default is set to 35 days. And a minimum look back window, which is set to 10 days. So let's go and look at this function, which again, I have prepared down here. It's quite a simple function. Volatility is equal to the exponentially weighted moving standard deviation. It's right here. Volatility is equal to the exponentially weighted moving standard deviation of daily price returns using a look back window by default, which is 35 days, but it will accept as little as 10 days if that's all you have. And as for this bit here, adjust equals true, that's just referring to the exact formula Pandas uses to, to calculate the exponentially weighted moving standard deviation. And I don't think it's worth delving into the details of that. It's not very interesting. So uh, when it's calculated it, it returns that value, volatility. Let's return to the parent function. So we have calculated volatility and now we come to this other line, which again is calculating volatility. So it's basically revising our calculation of volatility by calling another function, apply min vol and feeding that function, the volatility that we just calculated vol and vol abs min. To understand that we need to actually explore this function, apply min vol, which again, I have down here. It's quite a simple function. If the volatility that we calculated already is lower than zero point lots of zeros one, then you set the volatility equal to that tiny figure. What's the rationale here? I'm not too sure. Standard deviation can't be negative, but I think it could be zero if all the values in the look back window were identical. So if I had to guess, I would say some of the functions in Rob's library might break if the volatility volatility value was equal to zero at this point in his calculations. And hence in, in those cases, the volatility value must be artificially inflated to this tiny, but non-zero value. And that's what it does. And then it returns volatility. Let's return to the parent again. If, if vol floor is true, and by default vol floor is true, I can see that up here, then run this block of code. So this, unless we do, unless we set otherwise, this will be run. Volatility is equal to apply vol floor. Okay, we've got another function being called. And this function is being fed volatility as we've calculated it up to this point. The floor min quant, which is the fifth percentile by default, floor days, which is 500 days look back window by default, and floor min periods, which is 100 day look back by default. We're going to have to look at this function line by line, which I have down here. <laughs> so we start by finding the rolling fifth percentile of the rolling volatility using a look back window of 500 days or as few as 100 days if that's all we've got. And that's done in this line here. Vol min is equal to the 500 day rolling volatility measured at the fifth percentile. As noted here, if we do have some missing values, then we would fill them with 0, 0.0. And finally, we return vol floored, which is the higher of whatever volatility we have calculated up to this point and vol min. And we return vol floored, whichever is the higher of the two. Now let's go back to the parent function again. I feel that was incredibly hard to keep track of. So now let's zoom out and take stock of what I think this function did. Firstly, we calculated the simple exponentially weighted volatility using a look back window of 35 days. Secondly, whatever we just calculated, we make sure the value isn't allowed to be less than this tiny number. 
Thirdly, whatever our volatility values are at this point, we make sure they are never allowed to be lower than the fifth percentile of rolling volatility using a 500 day look back window and definitely no lower than 0.0. .0. So in picture form, I think all of this volatility business was doing this. Firstly, calculate the 30, the, the rolling, um, calculate the volatility using a 35 day look back window. That's the red line. Secondly, never allow that to be set lower than 0. 0.000001. That's what the green line is representing. And thirdly, never let that volatility number be equal to lower than the fifth percentile of the <laughs> uh, rolling uh, of the volatility using a 500 day rolling window. One lingering question you might have is when we calculated volatility, we used the actual daily price change as in we all the way we were feeding price dot diff. Why did we not use the percentage daily price change? I think the answer lies in the fact that the exponentially weighted moving average crossover trading rule itself focuses on the actual difference in price between faster and slower moving averages. So we have consistency in the trading rule and the vol calculations. I'll say a bit more about that a little later, if that didn't make sense. Now we've covered the volatility calculations, let's go back to the actual trading rule. So we have calculated volatility and we've just talked about what that actually, how that's done. And then we can return, we can calculate the forecast, the raw EWMAC, as in the difference between the fast and the slow moving average, divided by the volatility. And like I say, both, both this and the volatility, they are being calculated using actual price changes. In neither case were we using percentage price changes. I, I, and I think that consistency is 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 good. I, I'd say the intuition between taking the gap between the fast and the slow moving average and dividing it by the volatility is that if that gap was huge, but the volatility was also huge, then the forecast shouldn't be very strong. You would expect the gap between the fast and the slow is more likely to be a big gap when volatility is high. But if you have a big gap at a time when volatility is low, that is very, um, that's a strong indicator. And that would result in a big number, wouldn't it? Big number divided by a small number, i.e. a strong forecast. That's the end of this video. It, I appreciate it was very hard work, but I think that by going through line by line and trying to reason about exactly what each line is doing, I think it probably sets good strong foundations for understanding the whole library and subsequent videos.